Wow, you all sound so excited. Well, hopefully you'll enjoy this talk. Maybe you're a little hungry. Maybe they'll have pie tonight at Chartwell's. But thanks everyone for coming. Today we'll be having a talk from Professor or Dr. Rahani Gaim, who teaches. Uh, what are you teaching this time? Analysis, um, actuary, history of math. Uh, he he teaches the whole gamut, so you'll get a good. A glimpse into uh, an interesting part of mathematics, a little bit of the history. We have a history of math class occasionally, so if you like this, keep an eye out for that. Dr. Gaim also teaches that. Um, but thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. You want to pray? Oh, you want me to pray too? How about that? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, we come before you today, and we just thank you for this time, and we just thank you for uh, Southeastern University. We could learn about uh, the world you created, and um, and just a uh, be with fellow Christians and just be in an environment where we're free to worship you and to learn about about the about your world. Lord, we just thank you for this evening. Be with Dr. Gaim as he uh, presents about Pi, and just be with these students. Uh, just give them an insight to the world that you have made. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 So before I start, actually, here's a, another explanation of Pi using Monte Carlo. And this was written by Professor Arnold Sorgato. Different every time. Okay, but it will work. Yeah. yeah. We'll come back to it, then maybe hopefully we can see it. Okay. So the so the title of the talk is why is that the ratio of any circle circumference circumference to its diameter is a constant. Actually, this has been known for more than four thousand years now. It's been known for many years. They have an idea why it seems to be a constant, but they can prove it for many years until Archimedes came about twenty five hundred years ago. Uh, before him, most people have a, actually many of them, uh, even in Egypt. Mesopotamia and other early mathematics, they knew the ratio must be constant. But so let me give you a little bit of background. One of his legacy is actually finding a proof of, or it's not a proof, estimation of pi. But there is even an early estimation in the Bible in 1 Kings 7.23, when they built the temple of Solomon, they used it for his columns, for his columns, and they they said the diameter was the, then he made the molten sea 10 cubits from brim to brim while a line of 30 cubits measured it around. So if you think circumference is 30 and the radius is 10 and pi would be approximated by three. So pi approximation would be three. Actually, not only, this came from the ancient Babylon. They, they estimated actually pi to be three also. Uh, this is like Medes also. But here's what they, they did in Babylon. They, they found the area of a circle. They, they didn't know how to find it, but what they did was, well, maybe it's three times the radius squared. That's what they said, the square of the radius. If you do that for any circle, three times its square of radius, then pi would be three, exactly three. And since the biblical timeline was with Babylon, maybe they were using the same mathematical facts or maybe they were using other facts, we don't know, we don't know. But as far as we know, uh, it seems to work. And in and, and, and Bible, actually, there are many other things also. And if you see, it's First Kings 7, 23, 7 and 23. Well, if you take the ratio of 23 over 7, actually comes about 3.28, which is very close, which is very close to pi. And they, there is a, some indication that maybe that's how they found out the verse and the chapter. The chapter divided by the verse which gives you closer to pi. Now, pi is very useful. Uh, in Egypt, we have a ring papyrus, which is in, uh, in England now. It gives an indication that the Egyptians knew approximation of pi about 3.1605. Very close. And the, the Greek uh, not mentioned Archimedes of Syracuse. That's that would be southern Italy now. It was part of Greek then. And uh, he approximated pi 
he gave this actually very interesting this uh, numbers you can see they are rationals and uh, we don't know how we found them now we can use continued fraction to show those are actually exactly pi approximation but during his time nobody know, knew how he found it and he gave in rational estimation and that was very amazing in his time in that time so uh, during the 5th century there was an Indian mathematician Aryabhata he calculated the value of pi we don't know how he did there isn't any record but we know that he had pi within 5 decimal digits from what we know now uh, a Chinese mathematician this was actually around 429 or in that area, calculated the approximation of pi 355 over 133. That is very close. What did he do? He used actually Archimedes' idea. They say he did not know Archimedes' work, but he followed his idea and he did 200, uh, no, 2000, let's see if I can find it. 24,576 uh, 24, grams. Isolation, I mean, using polygons, that's what they did. And uh, this was celebrated for many, I think this is very close. You can see the approximation here, you can see here. It's very good approximation, at least. It's, but this ones are all the same as what we know about pi now. This was done in the first century, so it was very good. The symbol pi was uh, coined by British mathematician William Jones, but it was made popular by Euler around 1737. Because Euler was so famous, he published it and it became the name of Pi. No, but the pi, pi came from the Latin perimeter, actually. That's what it meant, perimeter. It, it's not perimeter, but that's what they, they think it is. And Archimedes' method is quite simple. He thinks if you have a circle, you can inscribe a polygon of any n side. It could be a triangle, it could be square, it could be pentagon, and any. And then he could circumscribe what's on the outside, circumscribe. Then he said, if you can find the areas of those polygons, which we know, regular polygons, then we can estimate the area of the pi by taking the mean of the two. That's what, the, but Archimedes was more, I, I, I will discuss more about his work. That's what the talk is about, okay. A little bit known that anything about lengths, they didn't know, but uh, he seems to no, and we don't know how he knew it. Uh, I'll tell you later on. We have indication that he understood calculus before anyone else. But in his first, the length of continuous plane curves other than the straight line, whose length is simply the distance between the endpoints. That's all they knew. And Euclid elements, actually, they never discussed perimeter of a circle because they didn't know how to do it. Circles, they didn't know in, in Euclidean geometry, they didn't know it. So Euclid wrote the curving element books and they never discuss it. The theory of magnitude and ratios are introduced by Eudoxus, within which only comparison of ratios of quantum of the same type. You can't compare two things. Well, this would be very surprising for them because uh, Archimedes is doing line uh, circumference and line with diameter. That would be unusual and nobody heard that. How can you compare them? You cannot take ratio of the two. For some ratio means it would be area over area maybe of the same type. But for him, he can do that. And uh, that separates him from the rest, actually. There was another mathematician, Antipan. He seems to have the first uh, tried quadrature. What they did was, the problem of area was the main idea of, uh, from the beginning. We, we want to know area. So we were able to figure out squares, rectangles, maybe some triangles to find the areas. So Antipas thought maybe every figure could be quadruple or quadrature means you can describe it in terms of equivalent square. The, their areas would be the same. If I can translate a circle to a square, then I can find the area easily. If I can translate the triangle into a square, then I can find its area easily. They did, not only him, uh, Hippocrates was a very famous mathematician and he was able to do loon. It's called the loon. He put he said we can do quadrature of a loon. Then they say he said also you could do it for a circle, but there isn't any indication he said that he wouldn't make that much mistake because he knew that he cannot 
quadruple a circle. You cannot describe it in terms of a square. If you do that, you get into contradiction because pi would be pi squared somewhere. <laughs> it is. But uh, he said he couldn't do circle, but he did. He gave two quadrature of different loons, and Euler added two more, and someone else added one. So we know five, five loons that we can quadrature. We can find their equivalent squares. But these are very crafted selectively, you can't do for everything. So even um, when they came, so everyone figured out the circle is different. Everyone understood there must be something special about the circle because we cannot find the area. The area. That's why this method was brilliant also. From the surviving texts that we have, Eusebius, Euclid, Aristotle, and other predecessors of Archimedes, they all knew that the ratio would be C over D would be a constant, but they couldn't prove it. They couldn't prove it. Now, we don't think also Archimedes proved it, but we have a good indication that he understood the proof also. We have modern proof now. So, although it remains uncertain if Archimedes was the first to prove the ratio is constant, but his work is actually the foundation for what we know in Calc 2, adding infinite sums, infinite sums, the length. Actually, arc length was because of his work of Archimedes. It was a groundbreaking for finding arc lengths. For a circle, his strategy was to inscribe and subscribe convex regular and sided, anyone, any one of them. It could be any shape. Because regular polygons, we, we know how to find their area, we know how to find their circumference maybe, so we can find, but he was interested in terms of his circumferences. Most of them they were trying with areas, because area is also uh, involves, but, so his idea was if I can, let me give you examples here, there are here, three different ones, and the first one, we have a circle that we want to find the area, uh, the, the circumference over the diameter, but we need to know how to find the circumference. How to find the circumference. So, and so what he did was, I can inscribe maybe red triangle and then outside, so I know how to find their circumferences or perimeters. Then I would add the perimeters and divide by two, so it would give me closer to the circle. If I make, uh, if I, if I could uh, do more another circle. Well, what he did was, I can double it also. So if I can put points here, here, and here, I can put with six sides, then I can do it with both sides. I can do it just by adding more sides, it would make them two n, four n, and so on and so on. Or he could use hexagon, which we think was his preference. It was the hexagon, actually. That's the one that we have many indication he used hexagon. Or he could use another one. The red cracker is full side here. You can see the red is inside and the blue. So if I insert more points, more points, the area that is not on the uh, the area that is not accounted part of the area becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So I get closer to the circumference of the circle. That's what his idea was. Uh, and let me show you with the hexagon the way we think he did it. There are no, I don't think there are indication he did it this way. In fact, he might have done ge geometrical arguments. There are other ways you can show this one, but my favorite one is this one. So here's what he knew. He was very smart. If you have a regular hexagon, the sides and the radius are the same. The sides and the radius are the same. And Archimedes knew this one. So what he knew is this radius, and this one I just, uh, I'm going to use a unit radius, uh, one. The radius is one, so the diameter would be two. But uh, you could use any r here, r, and this is r also. They are the same side. He knew that. So what he did was, uh, it's easier for us to show. If you put r, there are six of them. So six r is the perimeter of this inscribed hexagon. Then if you divide by the diameter by two, it, uh, two r, which means because if you, if you call this one r, there are two r, so r is in the diameter, then it should give you three. The first uh, approximation he had was three. Then he decided to insert a point in each of them. Instead of six sides, he would make it 12 sides by doubling the sides, the number of sides. If you do that, then uh, what you could do is, um, the first one is three, but then if you, this one, here's what you did. 
So he inserts a point here and a point here, a point here. Just I, I have one for just demonstration purpose. But so here's what you do. Well, if I put one here, then this radius I would divide it by two. This sign I would divide it by two because this would be perpendicular bisector of that segment. So I will call it S for now. S is the whole thing, the side. For our purpose, it's one. If I use the one, it's easier to do. I'll show you why this is true for one. Uh, if you have uh, R, this would be R, this would be R, this would be also R. So you have a collateral triangle here. Triangle here. So what he did was uh, Archimedes decided to find this distance from here, the T, I call it T, but this is AQ. AQ is the segment that I, I'm interested in here. Let's call it T. S is from here to here. In our in our case, this is one. The radius is one. The red one here. This would be one half. This is one side. S would be S over would be one half for our purpose. For our purpose. So if I do that, I can find T actually. Here's what the, the, you can do. The way I have it on that picture. So <coughs> this is the the collateral triangle. This is S. This is one. This is one. This is one also. But I'll call it S for now. For one, I'll call it S. So if you insert a point here, this is T, and this would be another T. But if you take half of the triangle, still uh, this is the triangle that I have 90 degrees here. This is perpendicular. T is here. What they they call it T here is perpendicular. So here's what we can do. This one is S over two. Half of it is S over two, and this one, the whole height. Also, this one is. From here to here is one, the whole thing. But if I call this one edge, from here to here is edge, then I can call this one one minus edge. Then using Pythagoras theorem, actually, I can solve for edge and then for t, and that's what I get here. This is the t that I I find just using simple Pythagoras Pythagorean theorem. So you can see the t is actually two times uh, two minus the square root of four minus s squared. So you can just uh, solve it from this triangle. This triangle. Now that gives me S is this side of the first one. The whole S is from here to here, and this one is here. Then if I use the uh, here's the first one. When S is one, the one that we have, S is one here. You can see the T. If you put one here, four minus one squared, and it's a square uh, cube, the square root of three, two minus square root of three. If you take the square root of it, you would get t to be 0.5176. You multiply by the sides, because this is the second iteration, both sides. If I multiply by both, then I get about 3.105 for the first estimation of pi. Then I have to insert more points here and here uh, again on the other side, so I can make it 24 sides. Well, my new s becomes, the, pr the previous t becomes my new s, and then I switch them, I, I find new t, the next t. If I do that, this is what I just calculated some of them. I give this one my history of math class assignment as homework. So this is what, when, uh, when six, he knew it's three, here you can see. When it's 12, then the way we did it, this is what we found, then I multiply this one by two, by 20, this one I multiply by 12, so I get this one, I'm going backwards. Then when t is, this one again, if I apply it on this number, I get new t. When s, this, this becomes my s. The previous t becomes my new s. This one, I find this one. Then I multiply by 24, I should get this one. Then this one multiplied by 48. Uh, Archimedes did it up to 96, so his estimation would be stop in here. His estimation would be 3.1410. That is his, most people think that's where he started. The one that I gave you fractional values, the lower, uh, the the upper bound is this one for him, because the upper bound is from well, the the, the lower bound is from from inside from inside is what I mean. The lower bound would be this one, and you can see it's it's about to the decimal accuracy actually. But if you continue to work with him, you get more accuracy here. You get more. If you do 768, actually, you get, you get about four decimal accuracy. You can, you can see here. If you continue to do it, like what Zhu did, the Chinese Mahmoud Chan did, 
if you continue to this one by doubling, by doubling more, it's much easier to calculate than now. We can get more accurate to whatever this month basis we want. So that's how we think he did. Another way that we think it to find the area of the polygon that I did he used track maybe, but there is no indication they knew track in his time. But he probably knew. So the angles between the the angles that I have here, uh, he was able to. Some people think that way. We don't have any evidence if he did it. But if you see the angle here between this one here is equal to x, you can describe it the arc length in terms of sine and tangent. For the for the inside sine, for the outside, you can use tangent tangent angles. And he would find the area using that one or perimeter. They use perimeter also in his because uh, you can find 180 divided by any multiply by something and then it would give you the, that's how they think he did it. He gets the same accuracy, but that method actually is much better than this one because he could do it for the external one easily, for the exterior. It's the circumscribed uh, polygon. It gives you your accuracy. Uh, in terms of this, uh, now the question is, well, okay, he, he found a good estimate by doubling, but how do we know that converges to pi? Because our goal is to, to know pi. He gave lower bound and upper bound. That's what he did. He didn't, he didn't tell us where pi is, except we know it's somewhere in the middle. So here's what we know. He started with three, for the internal that I showed you, he started with three. This is what the, for uh, inscribed circle. For the subscribed, if he did for the outside, the polygon, hexagon on the outside, it would be two times the square root of three. Uh, I think it should be two divided by square root of three. Something that big, okay? He didn't start with that big. Then he doubled to nine, after 96, that's what he did. And finally, he said these are the bounds 3, 1, 9, 7, and 10, 71. 3 and 10, 71. Those are the two bounds he gave in his. Uh, this is written, written by Euclid in the elements also. So now, did he know calculus or not? Because he's given us inequalities, but he thinks pi is somewhere between this one and this one didn't say exactly what pi is. He understood it was approximation. Actually, he never said this is exactly the calculation of pi because he gave rational, and he knew it was irrational. Pi is irrational number, so uh, Archimedes would not say this is the uh, high, but that is the best estimation that we have so far. Because of technology and also his method is easy to iterate more, we now know we can do the, any decimal accuracy we want. We could do it up to 10, 15, we, just by doubling the sides. Just we keep doubling, write the program maybe to do that. Uh, but here's the criticism that we have on his work. Some possible criticism for his work. Um, the length of plane curves is not explicitly defined. He didn't tell us how he, he knows this is convergent. Because if you do, uh, of course he knew that uh, if you do the external, the the circumscribed polygons, they must be decreasing. Because if they are not decreasing, then they wouldn't converge to C. The inscribed uh, polygons, they must be also, their, their circumference must be increasing. So he knew that somehow. Otherwise, uh, in his writing, it seems to indicate that, but he never explicitly said, so we don't know if he knows the length of, what he is saying is the parameters, when he finds them, they are converging to the circle parameter. Uh, Archimedes intuition that the parameters Pn for the inside inscribed polygons, if I call them Pn for the inscribed, you can see small Pn for inscribed polygons. If you use hexagon, as you put more points, as you double them and double them and double them, so the new one will be n, how many n you're doubling them. That one is increasing and Pn decreasing from the outside, but there was no any justification why he says that. That assumption is not, not much chance don't think that is a proof. Don't think it's a proof. Uh, also, the inequality is this one. Alan does not guarantee that, that the parameters will both converge to C. The outside and the inside, they both would converge. And now we have different proofs than what he did. But Archimedes' definition actually is very intuitive. You can see, uh, implies some intuition in his, uh, the way he defined it. When he says 
P of n less than C less than P n somehow as n becomes larger and larger and larger the lower bound this one will get closer and closer which means it's increasing sequence P n is increasing sequence and as n becomes larger and larger this is must be getting closer to C and this must be decreasing so that seems very intuitive in terms of what he defined and most people think that he understood calculus calculus now we don't have any evidence that he did, but he understood also convex uh, and uh, regular. Convex means if you draw a line in any part, it remains inside. If you draw a line segment to points inside any uh, uh, convex polygon, if you have a regular polygon and if, if you have two points inside and if you draw a line, if it remains there, it's convex. If the line gets outside somehow, then it's not convex. It's not convex. So he understood from the convex regular polygons like hexagon, uh, well, at least some others, like circle is the example of convex. The circle, he understood it. And then there is Archimedes uh, Palmsest. Palm Palm this was discovered in 1906, somewhere in, I think, uh, in Europe. And that was his writing. And uh, what happened was some someone bought his Palmsest and they wrote religious stuff on top of it for many years. They couldn't find out. Actually, it was some religious uh, from one, I don't know, it might be Christian, I don't know what. But what happened was someone bought it and they found it in Europe and then they gave it to this, uh, an American, actually, a wealthy person bought it and donated to the museum in England, in London. And then when they researched it, they were able to see if there was calculus actually under his, his paper. They figured out he, he knew how to estimate areas using just uh, well, the way we do in, cal in calculus is by dividing into smaller rectangles. He might have his different, but they figured out, he knew calculus, and that's how he found the sphere volume area, surface area of sphere cones. He was the one who found them first, and nobody knew how he, because he never gave out how he, how he knew the volume of a sphere, except told us this is the volume of sphere. But now we, we I, I think it's widely understood that he understood actually that he knew calculus. Now the question becomes, if he knew it then, if we had his original work, we would have been in different civilization by now because calculus was invented, as we know, in the 17th, 16th century by until Isaac Newton came, nobody knew, Newton or Leibniz. But before that, we were just trying to find only for utility, using them for what we need only. We couldn't understand how to add infinitely many sums. We didn't know how to find area of irregular shapes. So uh, for that reason, that's why this is a brilliant estimation of pi. And uh, his estimation, although it seems very innocent, but I think it indicates that he knew more than what we know. He knew sequence in series, convergence, and other things. And also, based on his work now, we have line integrals in the And I think on the next talk, I'll, I'd like to show you how to use line integrals to find the area of a circle. Not only that, but using uh, methods of Newton, Euler, and others, we can find estimation, oh, serious approximation, okay. Now they are exact values, but as long as you know the series converge, we, we think they are exact, but we, we don't know what pi is. Still, it's irrational number, and uh, there are proofs of irrational number, we know now. I, I don't know if, uh, most people think Archimedes knew it, but he never gave that it was irrational number. But not only him, before him, they knew that it must be a rational number because they used to think that uh, if I have lengths that are proportional to other lengths, then they would be rational numbers. So, and when they did the S square, they put the diagonal, and then they said the diagonal is not proportional to any of the side. It was not proportional. They call them commensurate, commensurate uh, sides. You take the ratio of two lines, if it's twice, three times, four times, then you know that they are all rational numbers. That's how they think. The segments must be rational. Then when they did a square of one unit by one unit, they drew the diagonal, then they found out that's not actually an integer. Somehow it must be square root of two. They, we, we know the proof now. But when uh, during Archimedes time, they did not know that was actually not an integer. So it gave them an idea. There are many things that they did not know. Uh, Pythagoreans, they always liked figures with integers, that's what they gave us right angle triangles with many different solutions. The Egyptians seem to follow the same way, even in the pyramid uh, they do 
But Archimedes had different intuitions than all of them, than all of them. In many ways, he understood these ideas. The only problem with him was that we don't have any of his work. We don't know. We have to make up for what we think he did. And whatever I did now, it was not it was not credited to him, but most people think he probably knew this one. That's how probably he got it because he gave us the correct solution. The correct solution. So uh, that was basically how we estimate pi to any decimal. So accuracy. The one that I gave is up to 10,000 10, 10, but you could do any accuracy you want if you do. So that brings to conclusion the first talk. On my second talk, I would like to give you actually other estimations, including how others did. Uh, actually, there are many other ways we could find pi, the exact pi. And one of my, my third one is using this line integral. We can integrate using plug or make any bit. What he did was uh, uh, the same way we think in calculus now, but I think Archimedes knew that one also. And still, we don't have many sources to confirm that he knew it, but we have evidence that he knew it. And then Euler came and he gave us other ways of finding pi. Actually, Euler did more than that, but I'll discuss pi now. How they we know that there are many representations, serious representation, uh, uh, nested square roots that would give you pi. So there are many other ways we can estimate it now. In fact, we call they are exact, but they give us estimation way, best estimation. When we when we start at some end, then we get some accuracy. So before Euler, the best estimation you had of pi was the upper and lower bounds that Archimedes did? Or uh, at least before, not Euler, before him, some others knew maybe a little bit until Isaac Newton. Newton knew also pi. Okay. Newton knew, uh, his method is actually is much better than, but Euler did it in many ways. Euler was very smart actually, even when he found the sum of 1 over n squared, which should be a rational number, because both of them are rationals, 1 over n squared is rational. Then he found that pi squared over six. So somehow pi, the pi came in that sum. And that is still mysterious why we have the rational number on one side and every term on the other side is rational. If you, if you add the, for those of you who had calc two, the sum of one over n squared, convergent sequence uh, series, we know that it's convergent, but we didn't know where it converged. And in Basel, that they had meeting sometime and they said, well, Maybe there is some kind, and then Euler surprised everyone. Actually, this is a convergent series, but it converges, not only converges, but it converges also to pi squared over six, which was very strange, because from that one now, I can multiply by six both sides, and then if I take square root, it should give me pi. It should give me pi. But then uh, others also, from the same, like uh, the Mansur Carlos, if you take the half, uh, quarters, half quadrant of his circle, one quarter of a circle. You can integrate and in, uh, using Newton's method, you can say it's pi over four if you use one unit. If there are pi, four quarters on a circle anyway. And that was Newton. Newton showed that it was pi over four. So we have many other estimations now, and by just taking n, whatever we wanted to do, we can get it to any accuracy we want. So still it's irrational. We can't find the exact value, but we have serious representation, and most of them are very interesting. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so hopefully we'll continue it in the next <laughs> talk. What do you want? I'm not sure the estimation. The estimation? <coughs> that you were leaving running? Which one? That you were leaving running in the background? Oh, yeah, let's check that one. Okay. It's right down there at the bottom right. There. One? Yeah. Yeah, so it's 3.143. It's very good estimation. So if he kept running, it will go hopefully 3.14159. Uh, yep. To the limit of whatever the random number generator is. It'll eventually start to repeat and not get any better. But Okay, but it's a very good estimation too. It's a very good estimation. No, Professor Alman programmed that one. Maybe I should look at the last time. I just thought of this, um, <coughs> excuse me, and I don't know if it's something you've, you've looked much into, but I'd be curious if we could talk about it sometime, would be uh, if we had looking at pi, a generalized form of it for 
curved spaces. Okay. Well, because you can have situations where the diameter is longer than the circumference type yeah. of a thing in a curved space. So it'd be interesting if we we had something that. You mean in other dimensions? Hmm. In other dimensions. Yes. In other dimensions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at it, but I think it's possible that because uh, in the geometry we have non-Euclidean geometry and uh -huh. lines could intersect, parallel lines could intersect. It would be interesting to talk about sometime. Yeah. We'll find or look it. into. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Do you guys have any questions? Hopefully you guys like it, and then you can sign for history of math next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest thing.